afternoon, and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Angela Gryling Keen. I'm a reporter for Bloomberg News and the 106th president of the National Press Club. We are the world's leading. Oh, thank you. <laughs> we are the world's leading professional organization for journalists, committed to our profession's future through our programming with events such as this, while fostering a free press worldwide. For more information about the National Press Club, please visit our website at www.press.org. To donate to programs offered to the public through our National Press Club Journalism Institute, please visit press.org backslash institute. On behalf of our members worldwide, I'd like to welcome our speaker today and those of you in our audience. Our head table includes guests of our speaker as well as working journalists who are club members. And if you hear applause in our audience, I'd note that members of the general public are also attending, so it's not necessarily evidence of a lack of journalistic objectivity. <laughs> I'd also like to welcome our C-SPAN and public radio audiences. You can follow the hashtag on Twitter today using the hashtag NPCLunch. After our guest speech concludes, we'll have a question and answer period. I will ask as many questions as time permits. Now it's time to introduce our head table guests. I'd ask each of you to stand briefly as your name is announced. From your right, Richard Strauss, CEO, Strauss Media Strategies, and former White House Radio Director. Barbara Cochran, head of the National Press Club Journalism Institute, and the Curtis B. Hurley Chair in Public Affairs Journalism at the University of Missouri. Yolanda Carraway, CEO of the Carraway Group, and former Deputy Chair of the Democratic National Committee. Kathy Spiller, Executive Vice President of the Feminist Majority Foundation and Executive Editor of Ms. Magazine. Jamila Bay, host of Sex, Politics, and Religion Hour radio show and a blogger for the Washington Post blog, She the People. Ellie Smeal, President of the Feminist Majority Foundation and publisher of Ms. Magazine. Allison Fitzgerald, finance and investigative reporter at the Center for Public Integrity and chairwoman of the National Press Club Speakers Committee. Skipping over our speaker for just a moment, Nairi Wright, senior vice president of MSL Group and the Speakers Committee member who organized today's lunch. Thank you for that. Beverly Guy Scheftel, PhD from Spelman College and the founding director of the Women's Research and Resource Center and the Anna Julia Cooper Professor of Women's Studies. Nikki Schwab, Associate Editor of Washington Whispers at US News and World Report. Jennifer Sargent, a freelance magazine writer and former chairwoman of the National Press Club Board of Governors. And Deborah Silameo, Executive Vice President of Hager Sharp Incorporated. It's not often that one person can define an era. Our guest today had already made it as a high-powered woman in a man's world when she discovered that world was far too narrow to accommodate her. Gloria Steinem is the face of the feminist movement and was dubbed, quote, the leading icon of American feminism by Joelle Attinger in Time Magazine. She solidified her feminist legacy by co-founding Ms. Magazine in 1972. More than 40 years later, she is still a consulting editor to the magazine now published by the Feminist Majority Foundation. Ms. Steinem celebrated the magazine's 40th anniversary right here at the National Press Club last year. She said then it was the right place to do it since she was also the first woman to appear as a National Press Club luncheon speaker after women were finally admitted to the club's membership in 1971. She received a men's tie as a thank you. <laughs> She's in town this week to receive the Presidential Medal of Freedom from President Obama. <laughs> Ms. Steinem is a granddaughter of a suffragist and worked as a journalist in the 1960s after living here in Washington during high school and heading to Smith College, from which she graduated Phi Beta Kappa. After college, she spent two years in India on a Chester Bowles Fellowship, where she wrote for Indian publications and was influenced by Gandhian activism. 
In 1968, she helped found New York Magazine, where she was a political columnist and wrote feature articles. As a young journalist, she also wrote for publications including Esquire, and once hired on for a stunt as a Playboy bunny for an essay that was later made into a TV movie starring Kirstie Alley. She's helped found the Women's Action Alliance, the National Women's Political Caucus, and most recently, the Women's Media Center. <laughs> Along the way, Ms. Steinem's been criticized as a threat to male privilege and even knocked by fellow feminists when she wrote a self-help book and by some when she got married. <laughs> Today, she's a documentary producer and author, as well as a regular on the speaking circuit and says the fight for equal rights for women is hardly won, not only here in the US, but especially in developing countries. Today, she'll talk to us about big things left undone in a speech titled Still to Come, The Unfinished and the Unimagined. Please help me give a warm National Press Club welcome to writer, author, lecturer, editor, feminist, Gloria Steinem. First, I have to say, what an incredible collection of talent and great hearts and great minds there are in this room. Uh, you have to promise me to meet each other. It drives an organizer crazy to, <laughs> see, to see people who may not know each other. And as you have already heard, I get a big sense of history when I come back here, uh, in, including my own history. <laughs> And I can just say that as the first woman speaker, I remember so clearly my knees knocking and my voice quaking and losing all my saliva. Does that happen to you when you get, <laughs> each tooth gets a little Angora sweater, you know, that you're, right? <laughs> um, because I was so aware of the responsibility. However, when they gave me a tie, I felt completely free to say outrageous thing. <laughs> Um, and since then, I mean, it's so great that we've had but 11 female presidents of, of this illustrious institution. We had to pick it to get, <laughs> get into in the, in the first place. Um, and so many great women have joined great men in speaking here. Uh, and we did gather last year to celebrate the 40th anniversary of Ms. Magazine, thanks to the feminist majority. And I just want to say a deep thank you to the feminist majority uh, and to Ellie Smeal and to Kathy Spillar for carrying this forward. And we've got here the great, you heard we've got the great Beverly Guy Sheftel, right? <laughs> Who's a great troublemaker. Uh, and uh, Janetta Cole, I mean, who's educator and now, what's your proper title at the Museum of African Art? Director. Director. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and Alison Bernstein, who insists on calling herself Bernstein, even though it makes me Steenum, who's a great <laughs> educator and a great international activist. Um, and they're just, so many of you here, I just want to tantalize you to make sure you look around and see three or four people you don't know and you introduce yourself. Um, and it is a celebration of my inclusion among 15 people I greatly admire who are being presented with the Medal of Freedom by President Obama. Uh, there's no president in history from whose hand I would be more honored to receive this medal. Um, and um, it gives me a chance to say here, I'm especially grateful for this lunch, because actually when we get the medal, we can't talk, it turns out. <laughs> uh, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to say here that I would be crazy if I didn't understand that this was a medal for the entire women's movement. It belongs... <laughs> It belongs to Shirley Chisholm, and Bella Abzug, and Patsy Mink. Uh, and in the future, would be great for Robin Morgan, Suzanne Braun Levine, I'm just lobbying a little bit here, Joanne Edgar, Barbara Smith, Gloria Anzaldua, and so many more. 
And it has already honored Rosa Parks and Rachel Carson and Dorothy Hyde and Dolores Huerta and my dear friend, Chief of the Cherokee Nation, Wilma Mankiller, who I accompanied when she received her medal. Now, of course, if with all of that illustrious company I get uppity, I can remember that Dick Cheney received <laughs> as did Henry Hyde, whose self-named amendment has hurt uncounted numbers of women, especially low-income women, for the last 37 years, and we're still counting, right? Uh, but the power of this honor may be even more evident in the withholding than in the giving. I was reminded by Ellen Chesler, biographer of Margaret Sanger, that President Lyndon Johnson, even as he signed the first federal and international family planning acts into law, refused to bestow the Medal of Freedom on Sanger. He feared reprisal from the Catholic Church. Ellen told me that when she looked at Sanger's private history papers at Smith College, I'm proud to say the biggest archive of women's history, she found a poignant little handwritten note from Sanger asking that her body be buried here next to her husband, but that her heart be removed to Japan, the only country in the world that had ever bestowed a public honor on, on her. So <clears throat> I hope this is retroactive in honoring the work of Margaret Sanger. I hope she would celebrate this recognition that reproductive freedom is a human right, at least as crucial as freedom of speech, and that no government should dictate whether or when children. Whether we are male or female, the power of the state must stop at our skins. Uh, that she also might say that the backlash against reproductive freedom by a right-wing extremist minority, especially in state legislatures they now unfairly control by redistricting, is proof of panic of their misogynist, racist, and immigrant-fearing efforts to keep this country from becoming, as it is about to be, no longer a majority European-American nation. It is becoming one that looks more like the world and better understands the world. So Sanger might say, as I do, that there is no president of the United States who is more responsible for understanding that reproductive freedom is a basic human right than President Obama. However, there may be a movement problem with me as a recipient uh, because of my age. <laughs> I'm trying to absorb the fact that I'll be 80 next year. <laughs> I plan to reach at least 100, but I am really worried. I'm a little worried about mortality, but I'm also <laughs> worried. Uh, that my age contributes to the current form of obstructionism. All the people who say that movements are over and use ridiculous terms like post-racist and post-feminist, excuse me, right. <laughs> I can testify personally that the very same people who were saying 40 years ago that feminism was unnatural and unnecessary are now saying, well, it used to be necessary, but it's not anymore. <laughs> um, just to name one parallel to show how ridiculous this is, if it took more than a century for abolitionists and suffragists to gain legal and social identity as human beings for all women and men of color, now, we need, need, now that we need legal and social equality uh, and no power based on race or sex or ethnicity or class or sexuality, that's likely to take at least a century too, don't you think? And we're only 40 years into it. Also, as original cultures say, as Wilma Mankiller always said, it takes four generations to heal one act of violence. So truly, we are just beginning. So I would like to contribute a few examples of the adventures before us. And unlike David Letterman, I'm not going to try to uh, put them in any kind of order because <laughs> each one is crucial. 
And anyway, they're all just reminders for people in this room. One, women's issues aren't separate from economic issues or vice versa. Paying women equally for comparable worth done by men uh, would be the, bigger, uh, the biggest economic stimulus this country could possibly have. The Institute for Women's Policy Research tells us that paying women of all races equally to white men would put $200 billion more into the economy every year and would be way more effective than propping up banks and Wall Street because this money would get spent, not put into Swiss bank accounts. It would create jobs and help the poorest kids who are those who depend on a mother's income. But do we hear economic stimulus and equal pay in the same sentence? No, I don't think so. And after we do that, we also need to value caregiving work, caregiving work, which is a third of the productive work in this nation, at replacement value and make that sum tax deductible if we pay taxes and tax refundable if we don't. We could do that. Uh, two, a woman's ability to decide whether and when to have a child is not a social issue. <laughs> it is a human right. It is the biggest indicator of whether she is educated or not, can work outside the home or not, is healthy or not, and how long she lives. This country has the highest rate of unplanned pregnancies, teenage pregnancies, and medically complicated births in the developed world. It also has the least sex education, which allows web pornography to pretend to be sex education, though its truth is present in the word. Porne means female slaves. Erotica, eros, means love, mutual pleasure, and free choice. We've shown as a movement that rape is not sex, it's violence. We haven't yet been successful in showing that pornography is very far from erotica. Three, well, three relates to two and one <laughs> because women with children are less likely to get hired or paid well, while men with children are more likely to get hired uh, or paid well. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Nothing else is going to work in a deep sense until men raise children as much as women do. Deep. Right? Children will keep on libeling men by thinking they can't be loving and nurturing, and they can, just as well as women, and libeling women by thinking they have to be loving and nurturing. This is huge. Read The Mermaid and the Minotaur by Dorothy Dinnerstein, a book long before its time. I think we're finally ready for her. Four, the US is the only modern democracy without some national system of childcare, and now the average cost of childcare has surpassed the average cost of a college education. <laughs> Five, we're also the only advanced country that indentures our college students by saddling them with debt at the exact time they should be free to explore. And women pay the same tuition as men and get paid at least a million dollars less over their lifetimes to repay those loans. Which reminds me, much has been made of the fact that women outnumber men on college campuses. However, many are just trying to get out of the pink collar ghetto and into the white collar ghetto. Meanwhile, men in blue-collar union jobs are earning more than the average college-educated woman. So no wonder men are choosing not to run up all that college debt. Six, the digital divide is a pretty good proxy for power. For instance, more than 80% of internet users are in industrialized countries, and the fewest on any continent are in Africa. It tells us something here at home, too. Though men and women are only about 2% apart in computer use, 67% of white non-Hispanic households use the internet, while only 45% of black households have access. It is about power, and it is serious, and it is polarizing. So let's hear it for the librarians, who are the only ones I know of systematically fighting to democratize computer use. Seven, while we're celebrating marriage equality victories, great, let's not forget that 51% of us in the United States say, quote, homosexuality should be accepted by society. That was the question in the public opinion poll. But 69% of people in Canada do. 
Are we not comparable, at least to Canada? And 83%, 83% of people in Germany do. On campuses, students still ask me why the same groups oppose, say, lesbians and birth control. <laughs> <laughs> I think many of us don't yet understand that the same groups oppose all forms of sexual expression that cannot end in conception. Sometimes I fear that our opposition understands our shared interests better than we do. Nine, do enough people understand that racism and sexism are intertwined and can only be uprooted together? Think about it. To maintain racial differences in the long run, you have to control reproduction, which means controlling the bodies of women. Those of the so-called superior group are often restricted, and those of the so-called inferior group are often exploited, but both suffer. This is true for uh, sex and caste in India, just as it is true for sex and race here. It is a universal, global truth that these two things can only be uprooted together. And still, I think our common adversaries sometimes know our common interest better than we do. 10, and here's a final shocker, just for anybody who says it's post anything, right? Violence against females in the world has reached such a peak due to sun preference, and uh, sun which produces sun surplus and daughter deficit, to such practices as FGM and sex trafficking, to sexualized violence in war zones, to child marriage and pregnancy, which is the biggest cause of teenage female deaths in the world, that for what may be the first time in human history, females are no longer half the human race. On this spaceship Earth, there are now 101.3 men per 100 women. So before we think of causes as distant, of that cause as distant, let me also remind you that even by FBI statistics, if you add up all the women in the United States who've been murdered by their husbands or boyfriends since 9-11, and then you add up all the Americans killed in 9-11, and in Iraq, and in Afghanistan, and you combine all those numbers, more women have been killed by their husbands and boyfriends since 9-11 than all of those Americans who were murdered in 9-11, in Afghanistan, and in Iraq. We pay a lot of attention to foreign terrorism, but what about domestic terrorism? What about crimes in our houses, schools, and movie theaters that are 99% committed by white, non-poor men with nothing to gain from their crimes, nothing to gain from their crimes, but who are addicted to what they got born into. They did not invent it, but they became addicted to the idea of masculinity and control. It, those crimes, I think we might refer to as supremacy crimes, which is their motive, and really think about the why of it and the cost of the cre falsely created ideas of gender. But here's the good news. Thanks to a landmark book I've been talking about to some of you for a year, at least, <laughs> uh, called Sex and World Peace by Valerie Hudson and other scholars, we now can prove with 100 countries that the biggest indicator of whether a country is violent within itself or will use military violence against another country the biggest cause is not poverty, or lack of natural resources, or religion, or even degree of democracy. It's violence against females. It is that that is experienced first, and that that normalizes all other subject, object, dominated, dominator, conquering, superior, inferior relationships. Um, and, you know, in my list, I haven't included everything you know. I mean, the Equal Rights Amendment, we still, it would be nice if we had the Constitution, right, don't you? CEDAW. <laughs> the fact that three quarters of all immigrants now fighting a great battle in this town are women and children. I mean, you, you know all of those things. But those are 10 I just picked arbitrarily, so I dare anybody to say that this revolution is over. Because now we are on to 
the ways of denormalizing violence and dominance. We're understanding that we'll never have democratic countries unless we have democratic families. We're understanding that the idea of conquering nature and women is the problem, not the solution. We're returning to the original and natural paradigm of 95% of human history, which was the circle, not the pyramid, not the hierarchy. As Bella Abzug would say, our movement came from a period of dependence. We were dependent. So we naturally had to get up there and become independent and self-identified. And now we're ready for a declaration of interdependence, of interdependence among our movements and with each other. We are discovering that we in this room and everywhere else and we in nature and we <laughs> human beings are linked. We are not ranked. So moving forward, if we just do it every day, is not rocket science. And it's actually fun. And it's infinitely interesting. Just for one simple example, those of us who are used to power need to listen as much as we talk. And those with less power may need to learn to talk as much as we listen, right? But in both cases, it's all about balance and understanding that the end doesn't justify the means. The means are the ends. The means become the ends. So if we want, at the end of our revolution, not that there is an end, but in our imaginable future progress, if we want to have dancing and friendship and laughter and work we love in the future, we have to be sure to have some dancing and friendship and work that we love and laughter along the way. This is the small and the big of it. And we've just begun. Thank you. We're here at the National Press Club, so we'll start with a media question. How do you think the representation of women in the media has changed since you first got involved in the industry, and where do we still need to go? <laughs> How long do we have? No. <laughs> we have a while. <laughs> <clears throat> well, it has changed. I mean, uh, because there are smart, competent journalists and uh, all kinds of specialists on, on television that we didn't see before. I remember that the, just to show you how bad it was, the one, the, it was only one woman who did the weather, and she was uh, rising from her bed in a uh, satin nightgown saying, well, it's going to be stormy tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. Okay. <laughs> all right, so, so we... We have progressed, but obviously women are still something like 15 years younger in order to be uh, on camera. So just as you get experience, you're gone, you know? Uh, and there are fewer, and we're more diverse than we were, but not diverse enough. And, and think how important it is. Think how important it is. I mean, who would have thought that a little girl named Oprah <laughs> in the South, you know, would have looked at Barbara Walters and thought, I can do that. You know, we need to see people who, who look like us. So I would say we've, we have token victories, we've realized the problem, and you know, as the Women's Media Center always points out, par part of it is not on camera, but it, the big part is who's making the decision about what story gets covered, and that's you know, like, more like 3% women who are in the clout positions. So I would say we've made symbolic victories. We know what's wrong, but we're not even halfway there. Given how far we have to go, does calling attention to the disparities, both of women in the media as well as women's sources, create change? And if not, how do you create change? Mm -hmm. No, it, it does create change because consciousness, as we all know, in every social change and revolution on Earth, consciousness comes first the understanding of what's wrong and, and what could be. Uh, and we, and I know other people here, I mean, we, the Women's Media Center, have SheSource so that there's endless lists of experts. If you want to find somebody who is an expert in aeronautics who's a female human being, <laughs> you know, we, uh, 
we, we need those sources. We need to not just accuse the media, but help the media find, find other folks. Uh, and we ourselves need to do it. You know, sometimes I think that men get up in the morning, I mean, not the men who here who are exempt from everything I say, <laughs> but get up in the morning and look in the mirror and say, I see a public intellectual, you know, but <laughs> women don't usually do that. So we need to go to each other that, you know, say, hey, you're an authority on this, and then get training at the Women's Media Center or somewhere, you know, so you're, you're comfortable on camera. Uh, it, I can tell you from calling people up to get on camera, it is harder, you know, for, to get women to do it because of our self-image and because, of course, we think we have to do our hair and, you know, all those guys have a blue suit hanging in the closet and just put it on and go racing <laughs> So there, there are both internal and external barriers. Is it incumbent on journalists to seek out more women sources, or is it incumbent on women to empower themselves to be sources? You know, it's so interesting that anything that is only two choices is wrong. Have you ever noticed that? <laughs> <laughs> I think it comes from falsely dividing human nature into masculine and feminine, and then, you know, everything is... So, yeah, of course we need, we need both. We need both. But it gets to be ridiculous when you survey all the people who are writing about reproductive issues and 80% of them are guys without the organs they're writing about. <laughs> you know, so, so uh, this is not something you're supposed, you're not supposed to say the, the O word here. With, <laughs> so uh, the answer is that both are responsible. But I think that when we are looking at a story that arguably has more female experience or more experience from a particular racial or ethnic or group of sexuality experience. You know, we, we ought to understand that at least half of our sources, at least half of our sources, ought to have that kind of experience. This questioner says she, maybe he, but probably she, saw you speak at the University of Utah in 1975. The questioner asks, if you could go back and tell yourself to chill out about one issue, what would it be? And <laughs> what, what one issue would you tell yourself to get more fired up about? Ah. Uh. Hi. <laughs> 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 um, well, I think that the, the issues that I was chilled out, I should have been more chilled out about, had to do with self-criticism, you know, and, and it's still a problem, I think, for a lot of us, because I walk around after I've spoken, I'm sure, in Utah, right, thinking, you know, and another thing, or I should have done, or something, you know, so I, I, I wish I didn't do that so much. To what I should have been more in an uproar about is monotheism and religion, and, you know, I mean, religion is, too often, politics you're not supposed to talk about. Spirituality is democratic, and in each of us, it's a different story. But institutionalized, monotheistic religion, if God looks like the ruling class, the ruling class is God, let's face it. So, you know, we just, we, we have refrained from speaking about it in spite of all the history, say, of colonialism, you know, where they were very clear, the Bible and the gun, that's how we're going to conquer. That's, you know, what conquered, the, you know, you have to take away people's feeling that there is something sacred within themselves, that there's authority within themselves and sub get them to submit uh, to other authority and not only for reward in this lifetime but for life after death, excuse me. I mean, <laughs> you know unprovable, so, you know, very useful. The, <laughs> uh, no, I am much madder about that and uh, wish that I had talked about it there because I do remember that, uh, that at the universities in Utah there was an enormously high rate of suicide because of the strictness about sexual expression and so on. And still, I probably, in my memory, maybe you can tell me, but I don't think I was saying this at the time. <laughs> what keeps you going? What keeps the fire burning? And have you ever wanted to uh, just hang it up? And why didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, where would I hang it? I mean, you know. <laughs> no, I mean, first of all, first of all, <laughs> 
people say to me, well, aren't you interested in something other than feminism? And I always try to think if there's anything that wouldn't be transformed by looking at it as if everybody mattered. And so far, I haven't been able to find anything. And also, it's so interesting. You know, it's like a big aha. You know, you figure out what could be. And, you know, it's just constantly, constantly interesting. As, as to what keeps me going, it's you. I mean, it's our friends. It's, you know, we're communal animals. We cannot do it by ourselves. And I'm so lucky that because of the magazine and the movement and many other groups, I have a community. So when I am feeling crazy and alone, I have people to turn to. And we cannot, we cannot keep going without that. Actually, sometimes people ask me, what one thing would you like, you know, for the movement? And I always think, a global AA. That's what I would like. <laughs> <laughs> so that... Uh, Wherever we went, you know, uh, you know, any place in the world, you know, by a river, in the school basement, and you know, wherever, we would know that we could find a group that, however different, shared values, and was free and leaderless, uh, and sat in a circle and talked, spoke their own stories, and listened to each other's stories, and figured out that we are not crazy, the system is crazy, basically, <laughs> and supported each other. As you reflect back on the women's movement so far, what would you define as the seminal moment? <laughs> well, it would be an ovarian moment. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think e each of us has a different one. Probably, you know, each of us had a first or maybe several memorable ahas. Oh, that's why. Uh, you know, I was a, a journalist, uh, worked freelancing in New York, and, and even after we started New York Magazine, I was the girl <laughs> writer. And the other guys, and they were very nice guys, Jimmy Breslin and, you know, Tom Wolfe, all these nice guys, uh, would say to me, you write like a man, and I would say, oh, thank you. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and it, 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 it wasn't an, until, I mean, the experiences in my case, maybe yours too, had to pile up before I, I saw the pattern, and then I had an epiphany which was related to my own experience, which maybe is true for each of us, which is that I covered a speak out about abortion, and I realized that you know, that I had not told the truth about having an abortion myself at 22, and why not? If, and why? You know, if one in three American women approximately has needed an abortion at some time in her life, why not? What, what was secret about it, you know? Uh, and then as soon as I started to speak about it, you know, you know then other people, you know, I discovered it was often part of other people's experience or their family's experience. I remember sitting in a, a taxi in Boston with Flo Kennedy, the great Flo Kennedy, right? And she had written, Flo had written a book called Abortion Rap, which was totally about this. And we were talking about her book. And the old Irish woman taxi driver, very rare, probably, as a taxi <laughs> driver, turned around to us and she said, honey, if men could get pregnant, abortion would be a sacrament. And that's, <laughs> and that's where that came from. I mean, I didn't make that up, you know. I mean, so um, I, it's that experience, I think, of telling our own stories, of truth-telling. A couple of questioners asked whether 40 years after Roe v. Wade, we are moving backwards rather than forwards on um, women's right to choose. One questioner asks, what do you think about the fact that women in your home in the city of Toledo can no longer obtain an abortion without driving over an hour? Hmm. Yes, we, we are moving backward, not in public opinion. You know, if you look at properly phrased, you know, who should make this decision, the government or the individual, overwhelming majorities say it shouldn't be the government, it should be the individual and the physician. So we're not moving backward in public opinion, but we are moving backward in, I mean, as we can see, the anti-choice forces have not been too successful in Washington, so they've moved to state legislatures. Uh, though they murdered abortion doctors and bombed, firebombed clinics, 
that pr has proven not to be as successful as what they're doing now, which is getting state legislatures to make impossible to fulfill rules for local clinics. And the only way we can change this is to pay attention to our state legislatures. I believe that President Clinton just said this last week, you know, if, if we don't want a divided Washington, then we have to vote as much in off-year elections and for our state legislatures as we do in presidential elections. Because as long as some, many state legislatures can, I mean, they're in control of the insurance companies, the people who build prisons and then put people in them who don't deserve to be in prison, the, you know, the, it's, and then they redistrict in order to keep, make that uh, control permanent, which is why the House of Representatives is as it is and the Senate is not. You can't redistrict a whole state. <laughs> you know, you can only, so uh, the, the, our response has to be um, organizing uh, and knowing who our state, most Americans don't know who their state legislators are, and that's why they are able to, uh, an, an anti-choice right-wing minority is able to do this uh, state by state. And it is very much about a backlash against the changes in this country. I mean, they're very clear. Having enough children, they say to me. You know, um, and it's, um, it's why the issues all go together. Uh, so, you know, the anti-immigration, anti-birth control, anti-abortion, and so on. So we have to take back our state legislatures. Citing the example of working moms versus stay-at-home moms, a questioner asks, what are your thoughts on the way women treat each other? Well, if we were ever asked a question that included men, we might <laughs> give a better answer. What, I mean, do we ever ask men, can you have it all? Uh, you know, we need, we need work patterns that allow everybody to work and also have a life and have kids if they want to, men too. The whole idea of stay-at-home moms and uh, moms who, I mean, it, the language is bananas. Uh, women who work at home work harder than any other class of worker in the United States. Longer hours, no pay, no support. <laughs> So let's just never again say women who don't work. It's women who work at home or who also work at, and let's always ask all those questions of, of men too. Uh, it, it's just divisive, this can you have it all. I mean, not everybody even wants it all. So, you know, and if you have to do it all, you can't have, have it all, obviously, whether you're a man or a woman. You recently commented on Miley Cyrus's recent hypersexual public appearance. Can you expand on the issue of women using their sexuality to get ahead? Well, if you have a game in which, okay, <laughs> I believe that the Miss America contest, if you count up all in the contests in each state and the national contest, is still the single biggest source of scholarship money for women in the United States. This is crazy. But if a handsomeness contest was the biggest source of scholarship money for guys, you can bet they would be there, you know. <laughs> so it's, you know, we, we play the game by the rules that exist, but we, we need to change the, the rules, obviously. So I, 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 it's, it's not that we aren't responsible for our actions, we are. If feminism stands for anything, it's that we are responsible for our actions. But we also need to look at the context. As Wilma always said, context is everything. <laughs> and what choices are there? So, you know, if that's the way, the game that exists, that's the game people will play. Miley, included or excluded, what is your message for today's young women? Well, my big serious message is, don't listen to me. <laughs> listen to yourself. That's the whole idea. And I, the best thing I can do for young women, I think, is listen to them. Because you don't know you have something to say until somebody listens to you. 
And each of us has authority and, and unique talents inside us. Um, so, I, you know, people sometimes uh, uh, often ask me at this age, <laughs> who am I passing the torch to? And I always say, first of all, I'm not giving up my torch. Thank you very much. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> but also, uh, I'm using my torch to light other people's torches. Because the idea that there's one torch passer is part of the bonkers hierarchical idea. And if we each have a torch, there's a lot more light. So, you know, lighting a young woman's torch often means listening to her and supporting what it is that she wants to do, encouraging her. Do kids today know enough about the feminist movement, and let's include boys in those kids? Should they know more, or is it a victory that it doesn't occur to many kids today that things may not be equal for girls? Well, it would be nice if they learned history, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> they don't learn the history of the women's movement, the civil rights movement, uh, you know. I mean, you can seek it out now. That's a step forward. You can find those areas of study. But, uh, you know, the textbooks of Texas are a pretty good example <laughs> of, you know, eliminating the history of, of social justice movements because heaven forfend, if we learn how it was done before, we might learn it again, do it again. So. Um, I, again, I think it's the context that we need to look at rather than blaming the, the individual. However, having said that, if you gave me a choice between knowing history and getting mad about the present, I would say get mad about the present. Even if you don't know history, just keep going. Um, I, um, I didn't, I didn't walk around saying thank you for the vote. I don't know about you. <laughs> I got mad because of what was happening to me. And, and I don't think gratitude ever radicalized anybody. It, it, you know, so I, if I had, I, I hope I don't have to choose between knowing history and, and looking at unfairness in the present. But if I had to choose, I would choose getting mad about the present. Is there any effort in the groups you're involved with to include more of the women's rights history in school curriculum? Is there any what? any effort to include more about women's rights history in the school curriculums? Yes, no, absolutely. Um, you know, the feminist press was a pioneer, for instance, in integrating uh, women's history into textbooks and creating those textbooks and their a lot of schools, a lot of devoted teachers, a lot of school systems, a lot of educators probably in this audience, right, who are, who are trying to do this. But the average textbook is, is still pretty slender. And you still, uh, it, it, you know, it's the politics of studying history. I mean, you still learn more about Europe than about Africa in general. You still, you know, it's, it is profoundly, profoundly political, the, the way we study history. And now we have, we have pioneers and reformers, and at least we know there is such a thing as women's history. The most cheerful thing that happens to me is on campus when I'm complaining about you know, my education, where it was like one sentence that said women were given the vote in 1900. <laughs> Somebody will stand up and say, well, why didn't you take women's studies? You know, it's so great. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it is getting better, but it's not, it's still not the norm. You touched on uh, care caregivers a couple times. This questioner asks, women who are raising and supporting families often get the least spoils in terms of political capital in the U.S. What must happen so that women and the children they're raising are able to make gains politically? Well, you know, it's has to be said that the voting booth is the one place on earth where uh, the single mom and the corporate executive are equal, where the very richest and the very poorest are equal. So it does have to do with knowing what the issues are on our school boards or in our state legislatures and getting ourselves out there, how, however uh, difficult that may be. Um, and it, it, it usually, in my experience, comes back to groups. 
You know, do you have a group with shared experience with whom you can talk and discover that it's not fair and that if you do X and Y and you start this particular campaign in your neighborhood or campaign for your school board, you know, you, you, you need, I think, to have that shared experience. And, and I, traveling around the country all the time as I do, I see mainly women's groups, sometimes men are part of it too, uh, but they have been together for 10 years, 20 years, 25 years. They're alternate families. They have seen each other through unequal education of their kids, through single motherhood, through divorce, through death. I mean, we need these alternate, these kinds of alternate families. Questioner says, women now make up 60% of college goers. Should this surpassing males be celebrated or is it a problem? Well, as I was saying, <laughs> it's, no, it's not necessarily a problem, uh, but I think we ought to be able to look at all the alternatives. You know, we, maybe we're, f you know, f frustrated programmers, and if we learned to code, you know, we wouldn't have to go to college in quite the same way. Maybe, you know, I think we're still a bit a prisoner of the idea that a woman should be able to go to work in a nice in nice clothing and clean and so on and shouldn't be under the sink fixing the plumbing that would make them three times more money. <laughs> uh, so it's it's not it's not that it's wrong. It's just that college has been so oversold, so oversold as as a life changing mechanism, and especially when you end up in such huge debt. I just think people need to be able to look at a wider range of alternatives. Questioner says, for those of us wishing to earn a world-class feminist education without life-crushing debt, would you please share some resources? <laughs> How long do we have? <laughs> Actually, you know, maybe we should do this as a group exercise. Everybody should pop up. I've already given you uh, Sex and World Peace by Valerie Hudson as a, as a great resource, right? There's uh, Dark at the End of the Street, which is a great retelling of, of the s civil rights movement with more women's stories added. Um, the, who, who, let's tell our favorite books, Julie. Well, Makers, oh yes, thank you, Makers, yes. <laughs> Makers' uh, three-hour television special on PBS now is also a website with about 200 interviews, which is a huge, wonderful resource, a very, very important present and historical resource. What other favorite books do we have here? Or favorite Words television? Of fire. Pardon? Words of, fire. Words of Fire, absolutely. Yes, yes, Words of Fire, we happen to have the, the fiery <laughs> people right here, right? <laughs> Great, yes, very, 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 very important. Stephanie Kooten's The Way We Never Were. Stephanie Kooten's The Way, Kuntz is the way, the Way We Never Were, right. And I mentioned Dorothy Dennerstein, The Mermaid and the Minotaur earlier, which uh, was, I think, from the 70s or 80s, but really shows the degree to which the changeover to societies in which men were separated from children and didn't develop those parts of their humanity that come from raising children uh, was part of, of uh, creating uh, the kind of hierarchy we're dealing with now. I mean, that, that women leave the home and leave child-rearing and develop the rest of themselves, but not enough men enter child-rearing in the home and develop the rest of themselves. Yes, bell hooks. Feminism is for everybody. Yes, the great bell hooks. Yes. Ms. in the classroom. Ms. Magazine in the classroom. Yes, Ms. Magazine in the classroom. Hello? Yeah, well, what's wrong with us that we're not saying that? <laughs> <laughs> Ms. is in, in classrooms and a very important resource. And it also is in women's uh, prisons and a very important resource. Betty for Dan, right, absolutely. Um, the a classic, is obviously, especially for, for women who are in a traditional role, you know.
Mm -hmm. Well, just tell us where you live and we'll find you. <laughs> there's, there's, there's no, no shortage. And the Junior League also has become much more uh, an agent of social change than it ever was when I was growing up. I'm gonna, Pardon? I'm gonna cut in for one, one more uh, political yeah. question before wait, we wait, wrap wait. it up. Wilma Mankiller, we have to say that, yes, Wilma Mankiller wrote a wonderful, wonderful book in which she interviewed about 15 uh, women from Indian country. And, uh, you know, thank you, <laughs> Allison, for saying that because what you glimpse uh, as you do in various works by women from Indian country is a crucial fact that we big time are not learning, even in women's history, which is that the suffrage movement, uh, like the Underground Railway and so many things, was mainly a function of Native, of Indian country. And Native women were, uh, had, we would say equal power, but they didn't see, I mean, you know, they got to be called a petticoat government, the Cherokee, for instance, because female elders had to sign the treaties or they weren't legal. Women controlled their own fertility. Um, and they, the, the native women referred to European women as those who die in childbirth. They were appalled at these women who had come from the worst stage of patriarchy and couldn't decide when to have children and couldn't have them under their own conditions. So, you know, we're walking around on a history we don't know, and there are many brave women in Indian country who are trying to bring it back. Um, and there's a friend named Sally Roche Wagner, whose work you should look up as well, uh, who has written a book called uh, Everything We Want Once Was Here. You know, I mean, it's, and, and that's not only true of native cultures in this country, but also of the Quay and the San in South Africa, who will take you, or in Southern Africa, who will take you out into the desert with a digging stick and show you what they use for contraceptives and abortifacients and headaches and migraine headaches and so on. Uh, it's true of the Dalits of India. It's true of, of the original cultures of 95% of human history, so. Don't let anybody tell you that it's human nature that we live this way. No, no. It once was different, and it still could be. And the Native women are very funny about it now, you know, because you have to have a sense of humor, you know, given what they've gone through. What did Columbus Equal women. <laughs> <laughs> we are almost out of time. We have one more question. Before that, just a couple of housekeeping matters. First of all, I'd like to remind you about our upcoming speakers. On December 3rd, we have the Honorable Juan Manuel Santos, the President of Colombia. On December 16th, Dan Ackerson, the President and CEO, sorry, Chairman and CEO of General Motors. On December 19th, Ricky Skaggs, Grammy winner and bluegrass legend. And on January 15th, Christine Lagarde, head of the International Monetary Fund. And, before the last question, I'm very pleased to present our guest with the, for a long time now, traditional National Press Club coffee mug. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know when we abandoned the ties, but I'm pleased to give you a mug. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and the last question, what did you do with that tie? <laughs> I haven't the faintest idea, and I don't care. <laughs> but wait a minute, I just have one more book that I... Uh, <laughs> there is a wonderful, small, well-written, well-researched, wonderful book called Exterminate All the Brutes, which is a line from Heart of Darkness, actually, by Sven Lindquist, S-V-E-N-L-I-N-D-Q-V-I-S-T, who is luckily Swedish with that name, <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, it's about the invention of racism. It is a brilliant, brilliant book, exactly why it was that Europeans, having become overpopulated because they suppressed women and made women have babies and so on, he doesn't quite say that part as he should, but anyway, the, uh, then in order to take over other people's land, invented the idea that those people were inferior. And you know, it's a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant book. 
Uh, and, you know, let's keep this going. I, don't you love all this? So at your table, keep doing it. Keep <laughs> handing around ideas. Thank you. Thank you for coming today. Thank you also. Thank you to our National Press Club staff, including our Journalism Institute and Broadcast Center, for helping organize today's event. Finally, here's a reminder. You can find more information about the National Press Club online at www.press.org. Thank you. We are adjourned. <laughs>